Yeah, I think uh, we had a mini symposium on Pachyco, right? Jay, you wanted a full day symposium probably, but this one is good enough to start <laughs> off. So I think uh, uh, my talk is slightly different. Uh, it's uh, more about uh, Brolicizumab. What are the uh, experiences? And there are numerous questions around it. So it's not just about saying that uh, my experience of X number of cases, but on most of the slides, there will be some questions as to what do we do or what are the challenges it throws up. But the biggest unmet need uh, so far, we all know is about the burden of uh, the number of injections and uh, how brolicizumab acts for a longer duration is because of the small molecular size or molecular weight, more number of molecules per injection can be packed into a given volume. And that's why it lasts longer. And also because of its uh, a smaller size, it does penetrate deeper into the retina and under the RP and all CNVMs are under the RP. And that's why it's important to understand this and see how it clinically correlates that most of the edema, if you look at the trials now, um, uh, the edema reduction on OCT is much more with brolicizumab. And that's what many of the speakers so far uh, in India have also shown in their cases that the edema reduction with the drying effect of brolicizumab is much more than the other molecules. Uh, just to mention about the Hawk and Harrier trial that uh, more than 50% of patients were uh, maintained on Q12 dosing even at uh, year one and year two. Uh, and that's how uh, this Brolicis map is useful in the sense the number of injections required or the frequency with which it has to be given is less compared to, let's say, Bavacizumab, Ranibizumab, or Aflibercept. The other concept I would like to bring in for the discussion at the end is how do we do, deal with the different compartments of fluid while the fluid study and post-hoc analysis of you and CAT studies have shown that patients with subretinal fluid in fact tend to do better than those who do not have subretinal fluid, but intraretinal fluid <coughs> has been shown consistently to have bad outcomes. So how do we deal with uh, complete drying of the macula? Because the Hawk and Harrier trial showed slightly something different from what we have known about the fluid study or the post hoc analysis from the other trials is that uh, patients, even with a small amount of subretinal fluid in the Hawk and Harrier trials, did worse than who had uh, no SRF. Now, this is contrary to our earlier uh, belief or what the data had shown. So what Hack and Harriet trial shows that you should have a completely dry macular, it's preferable. And also that if you see on the right-hand side column, the sub-RP fluid, that is also important uh, in with the, with the data here. Typically, we have never um, paid much attention to sub-RP fluid as long as there's no sub-retinal fluid or interretinal fluid. But from the Hawk and Harrier data, it seems that even flattening the RPE may be associated with better visual outcomes. And Brolicizumab does have a good effect on flattening the RPE. Uh, we had a survey last year for VRSI members about how whether they tolerate subretinal fluid. And 50% uh, uh, of the uh, members who voted said that they would tolerate some amount of subretinal fluid, although this needs some tweaking and a better understanding. And quite a few members said that they would not tolerate any subretinal fluid. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to present some cases now. This uh, gentleman actually um, had come to us with very poor vision in the right eye and as well as uh, moderate vision loss in the left eye and he received a um, brolicizumab injection on 7th October. This was the pre-injection. You can see subretinal fluid, pigment epithelial uh, detachment or sub-RP reflectivity and also intraretinal reflectivity and subretinal shrum. And uh, when, he, when the patient came back after a month, vision was maintained, but you can see the flattening of the RPE as well as the subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid have reduced significantly, but yes, it doesn't mean that one injection solves everything. Uh, these patients do have recurrence, but it's not that they get recurrence in a month. Sometimes they get recurrence after two months or three months, 
So after the patient got a recurrence of fluid in December, uh, this patient got an injection. Now, even after a couple of months, the OCT is flat. So should you be giving loading dose? Should you be treat and, uh, treating and extending? These are the other questions which will come up for discussion. This is another patient uh, who had come to us just before COVID last year, COVID lockdown. And I'm bringing this up because we are entering in some cities again into a lockdown phase in India. And then when this patient had presented before COVID, his uh, left eye had 20-80 vision, it had dropped to 21-25 when he came after the lockdown in October. Uh, we gave injection uh, immediately when we saw him. And the top one is pre-injection. You see a lot of uh, intraretinal and subretinal fluid and also PED uh, sub-RP elevation. And then in November, you can see the intraretinal and subretinal fluid have dried up and in January, that is three months after the injection, it's still dry. Um, and the last case that I would like to show is a patient who had received uh, 25 ILEA aflibercet injections and had still used to have some amount of intraretinal subretinal fluid. And we decided that let's try out um, brolicizumab. And within one day after the injection, she developed uh, severe vitritis, there was no view of the fundus, uh, hypopion, and corneal folds. Um, and this is quite unusual that within a day you get this. So obviously we had endophthalmitis in the back of our mind. There was hardly any congestion, no pain, no lid edema, nothing. It was just a quiet eye with uh, vitritis. So we did do um, vitreous tap uh, and subjected to microbiology. There was no growth, no organism on smear. PCR was negative for bacteria. And then we had also started our own intensive topical steroids and you see it just melted away the inflammation. We got back the view. The good thing to also note is that within five days, the brolicizumab has had a significant impact on the macular fluid. There was uh, a almost complete uh, drying of the macula within five days. But now the problem is this was in October, November, the patient had now got back uh, fluid and we gave ILEA aflibercept again. It's, it's not working. And we are not keen on repeating or re-injecting brolicizumab. So what do we do? And in fact, this patient has had a OZX injection along many times to just to potentiate the anti of action. So the concerns do remain about inflammation and vasculitis, but touch wood so far, uh, uh, there have been probably more than 600 procedures, maybe 700 procedures in India. Uh, we have a mechanism of tracking any adverse events, but so far, uh, as far as we have known, there was only this kind of adverse event, no um, occlusive vasculitis, which has been reported so far. So with that, I stop my presentation and would be happy to take questions. So Raja, can I ask you a question here? Uh, yes, Dr. Raja. Yeah. So were there any red flags for this patient when you injected? You had a prior uh, experience of injecting Pejinax in other cases. So in this particular case, was there something which showed you that this patient may behave like this? Now, this patient has been under treatment with me for the last more than uh, nine years now, and Jay would be knowing. Uh, so, uh, this patient did not have any, uh, any red flag signs as such. While I had injected four other patients probably before I injected this patient, uh, we are always careful about patients who have had a past history of inflammation. This patient uh, had undergone PDT earlier, in fact, twice. But uh, there were no other red flag signs in this case. In fact, she's the mother of a retina specialist. Um, yeah, there were no red flag signs in this case. And now that you have uh, seen that it's not responding to any other agents, would you, and the patient responded to steroids, so would you, uh, would you ever dare to inject uh, Paginex with a, with a, with a Ozutex insert? Um, are you asking whether well, yeah, whether you, if you want to see, she, the patient responded to Pagenex but had inflammation. So uh, having known that, would you, uh, uh, after getting patient's consent, in, inject Pagenex with steroid cover? 
Yeah, that's a good question. As of now, I don't have the guts or even that retina specialist is also not keen on giving rolicizumab again. But we are, because this patient has received aflibercept again. In fact, after aflibercept, it has increased the edema and she has never responded to ranibizumab earlier. So we are going ahead with the nosodex with aflibercept at this point of time and see what the response is going to be. The last resort would be a re-injection of uh, brolicizumab with lots of prayers. Yeah, I think most of these uh, adverse events have occurred in patients who have had therapy, you know, uh, previous therapy, of course, the Hawk and Harry and treatment naive patients. But I think uh, most of them, um, uh, at least in our experience, so there, there has been one occlusive vasculitis in Germany in the clinic that I uh, consult. And the patient presented within the biblical four hour limit and we were able to uh, uh, get back full vision. There were no residual field effects or anything. And the other patient had a macular hole. Both of them had at least had 50 to 70 injections of either animism or aflibur. So I think that can only happen in the Western world in India. I don't think anybody I, has any patients. Yeah, I, I just wanted to steal a minute and ask Caroline to share her experience with brolicizumab because uh, I'm sure uh, Caroline must have used it. I haven't used so far. I had scheduled a patient, but after last year's macular society results, I switched her back to ILEA. Caroline, do share your uh, experience. Well, we, we have published on some, we published on um, a collective group of patients that had occlusive retinal vasculitis uh, from multiple uh, centers. And then we most recently have a publication coming out in JAMA Ophthalmology, looking at 172 eyes that were treated with bolucizumab from five consecutive eyes from five retina specialists. And I, I, what I would say is we really don't understand the pathogenesis. They, the, most of the patients, when the drug became commercially available, most of the retina physicians switched patients who were unresponsive to other agents. I mean, those really seem like the patients who need it. Um, in our series, patients had had a mean of 20 previous injections. Um, and I think in the majority of cases, patients might present with inflammation without vasculitis. It seems like the rate of occlusive vasculitis is about 0.5%. And that's from what we found in our retrospective series, but also what the safety review committee found. That is a committee that Novartis put together to re-review the Hawk and Harrier data. Um, so it's kind of like it appears to be a spectrum. Some patients just get a little inflammation. Some patients might have more severe and some patients get occlusive retina vasculitis, which is typically with inflammation. Um, but I think it's, it's rare, but it can lead to vision loss. So that's something that patients have to be educated about. And I will say in our retrospective series of these 172 eyes, we found that female gender was associated with occlusive vasculitis. Although it's not clear, more females are often treated, but females seem to have a higher incidence of uveitis. You know, it's not totally clear why that is. And there were some men who did get inflammation. Um, we also found that bilateral same-day brolicizumab injections were associated with occlusive vasculitis. But so, you know, it's perspective, so it's hard to say. And we did not find a prior history of inflammation to be associated with occlusive vasculitis in our most recent series. But it, you know, it was retrospective, so it's not perfect. So Dr. Bamal, this patient was a, a female, it, she was a lady. So uh, uh, what were the odds ratio in your study, uh, male to female or female to male in terms of the higher risk of inflammation? Uh, it was a relative risk. And I can't tell you off the top of my head because there were so many numbers, but it'll be in JAMA soon. It was over one, one point something. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Karen, I have a question. So the occlusive vasculitis, was it for the first injection or subsequent injection? Um, there were some patients that have had it for the first brolocizumab injection. They had previously been treated with other agents. And that was a paper that was in ophthalmology um, uh, last year. So did you inject any patient with vitritis or inflammation 
repeat it with uh, Pejinax or Brolisozumab the second time or no? If I have if I have a patient that has inflammation to any anti-VEGF agent, I would very unlikely use that agent again. I mean, repeated inflammation has been reported after a Flibercep too in some in some people. I would try to avoid that agent and maybe use ranibizumab, maybe reassess my thinking, um, you know, why they're not responding to any anti-VEGF aging. Could there be, you know, polypoidal or something else going on? Um, but I would try to avoid that agent again. Uh, Roger? Roger, uh, one question is that you see uh, the company label says around 4% uh, possibility of uh, inflammation or occlusive vasculitis. I know that in India, more than 1,000 patients have been done and only one patient uh, being reported as what you are saying as inflammation. I have done around 13 eyes. Uh, none has developed any inflammation and no vasculitis at all. So, uh, and whereas all these studies show 4% chances. So, well, I think that it's 4% inflammation. It's not 4% for occlusive no, vasculitis. No, no, yeah, yeah, was 4% inflammation, 3%, um, I don't want to say the numbers wrong, but the, if you look up the safety review committee, they'll, it will say the exact numbers, but it was like 4% inflammation, then lower for inflammation with yeah. vasculitis, and then yeah. even lower for vasculitis with occlusion. So going back, going by those figures only, uh, out of uh, more than 1,000 eyes, uh, is there any data that uh, how many have had inflammation, Raja? Yeah, so, Lalit, I mean, it's a good question that you have. As, as I said, it's not a proper study that we have at this point of time. While VRSI is, has shared the Google Doc for everyone, uh, all the members, uh, saying that if you see any inflammation, do report to us. Unfortunately, it may not be very accurate, but uh, I do believe that uh, people, there are more and more people are using this drug now. Um, and uh, there are very few reports otherwise of uh, inflammation. So again, whether it's because of Indian population being different or we are under reporting, there may be both, uh, we don't know the true figure at this point of time. I, 